Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig. I have a very quick but really important announcement that I'd like your help with. Sometime late next month, we are going to be dropping episode number 500 of original content, and that's roughly 21 months after I started this show. I'm really excited about that, and I'm really grateful to all the amazing guests that have made this possible, as well as to you and all the support I get from other listeners like yourself. So thank you very much. I'm thinking of maybe doing something special around this event, like maybe doing a Facebook Live event or a uh, behind-the-scenes episode, either on Facebook Live or an actual audio, another episode show, where you could send in questions about the show in general or about particular guests or show episodes, behind-the-scenes questions, or any qu- questions about me or about whatever you want to ask, and I'll answer them, or you know, something else. I'm really not sure what to do here, so if this is something that interest you. I'd love to get your feedback, maybe some ideas and input on what you might like to hear or see, or perhaps I should do nothing. I'm, I'm really good with that as well. So if you could respond to this and let me know what you'd like or, or what you wouldn't like, along with if you have questions, the questions you'd like me to answer, that would be great. And the uh, best way to do that is you can email Craig, C-R-A-I-G, at Everyone loves guitar.com. One thing to keep in mind, appreciate I get asked the question, what's your favorite episode? Literally every single time I meet someone who listens to this show, and I never mind answering that question. But if there's not any more questions like that, then I can't do any kind of a special event. So have some more questions beyond that if you have any. Otherwise, uh, I'm not really sure it would make sense to do something along those lines. And again, I'm open to any ideas you have. Anyway, with that in mind, thank you again very much for all your support. Thanks for listening. Uh, this has been a blast. It's It's been incredible, probably the, the most fun and exciting project I've done in my entire career. And uh, I will look forward to episode number 500. Send your ideas and thoughts into me at Craig, C R A I G, at everyone loves guitar.com. All right, now let's get moving. The Be Fulfilled Journal helps you be more honest with yourself and with others and be more open to handling things you've avoided dealing with for years. It's a 12 week online and journal program that helps you identify and eliminate things you do that are causing you stress and live in more gratitude and joy. It was actually developed by a long-term friend of mine who got sober in 2008, and he's put together a great deal just for my listeners. You get the 300-page hardcover journal and access to the 12-week video program online, plus free shipping, plus membership in a private Facebook support group with others going through the program, plus a five-day mini course showing you how to let go of stuff that's draining your energy, plus a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. To start your journey and get all the bonuses, go to BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. That's BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. That's EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome, everyone loves guitar. And we are with the one and only Phil Collin from Def Leppard. And first thing I gotta say is neither Phil nor I are wearing shirts. We're both we're both jacked. There he goes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest question. People said, Is he gonna wear a shirt? I'm like, I I think I mean like that didn't enter my mind. Like I would it would be kind of weird if you shut up without one. I mean you do your own thing. Right, absolutely. I, I don't judge, but I mean everybody was like so yeah, Phil's got a shirt on. We're both full sure. of, no pants. We're both no pants, but that's all right, man. It doesn't make you a bad person. Um <laughs> man, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate Pleasure. it. And thanks for all the freaking killer music and killer riffs you've played over the years, because I've certainly thank enjoyed the shit out of them, man. Thank you. Um congratulations, first of all, on the Hall of Fame. How did that go? 
It was great. You know, it's um, I, I don't really like award things. They, they, it's, it's a, it's the whole function thing. I, I like the fact that, that we had the fan vote influence the panel. The, mm. there's, so there's a panel of 26. They choose something else, and it goes to a panel of a thousand. Of that thousand, one vote is a fan vote. Only one vote. Mm-hmm. So, um, but we had overwhelming um, support from the fans more more than anyone's ever had before. So uh, it influences the people voting because That's they don't great. want to be, they, they don't want to go. Oh my god, we can't ignore that. So that that was cool, and I was so proud of of our guys, our, our fans for for doing that because it actually meant more to them than it did to us. That's very cool, man. And yeah. again, as I talked about that earlier, it's one of the things I admire about you that I it was funny because I watched the speech. And just from the limited first chat we had and then, you know, reading your book, I was like, I know that you're happy to be there, but you're, you'd be just as happy being at home with your son that was on your lap two minutes ago. So that was really cool. Um, Also, man, I read your book. It was great. I read it on the flight to and from New York last week. Um, You did a great, well-written, interesting. You did a really good job, really good job communicating your thoughts and feelings in a very clear and simple way. And I also give you a lot of credit for at the end, you sort of took four or five or six pages and you said, hey, this is who I am. Right, the coda part, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was really yeah. cool, and I, and I vibed a lot with that, especially, you know, you, you have this overall philosophy of uh, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. You know, you got to take care of your own shit and be responsible, but you got to question everything, and, you know, I thought it was a very, like a punk, a modern punk aesthetic, you know, because that's what punk was about, right? Questioning everything and challenging authority and asking finding out is this real and i thought that a lot of your your thoughts on social media and um just the the dumbing down of the willing acceptance of dumbing down sort of you know i, I agree with it like, which we see all the time yeah it is but even the way the book came out you know um i, I done it with chris Epton. it was great he'd done all this research and he, and he interviewed me for hours and everything gave it to the editors and they they added and took away all the real stuff and we were like wow this is not who i am they go well it's, you know we got the release date and i said you know what is i'm gonna write you a check for the advance back um, um this isn't who i am so they said well what do you want so me and my wife helen rewrote it we got it all back rewrote it and they are they didn't touch any of that and so that's what you you read was was our reworked Dude, that is that is very it, it cool got, it, it was, you know, it got so far. It wasn't what me and Chris had initially done. It because it, initially they 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 want a motley crew type thing, and I said, but, you know, it's not that. That kind of happens to every band anyway. But this is about something else, and they 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 didn't they weren't really aware of that. And then when we started rewriting, you know, their edited version, they were like, wow, this is great. So we got the okay, and then we, we did that. maybe more than a month, but it wasn't much more. And we just like kind of hit it, rewrote it, and. Good for you. I like that you're always involved with your wife. You could tell, you know, she's a big part of your life. That's really cool. That being said, this was my favorite line in the book on page 51. I got rip roaring drunk, had sex with a girl and threw up all over her while I was fucking her. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That was classic 1980s rock. That was the that was that 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 was what they wanted probably for chapters on end. (laughs) Yeah, but well, that yeah. was hilarious, man. <laughs> but touche, man. Great book. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, you, you had a pretty good vision early on that you were going to be a rock star. Like when I, you were like, that's it. I, this is my, it was beyond a, like a dream. It was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. You have no plan B. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it, um, yeah. Talk about that. Like, are you like that with everything that any goals you have or is this a unique um i i think it is i think i was it was slightly naive looking back at it because i i tell everyone else to have a plan a b c d f g you know oh, yeah. and all of that and i think that's kind of prudent and, and smart to do i didn't do that so there was a, a naivety but there was also um a, a willpower and, and something else that i was 
prepared to put in and 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 that's still there you know the our band works really hard. It's, it's, it's great. You know, I, I've had people go, well, it must be great being a rock star. And I've, I've said to them, I'll tell you what, come with me for a day <laughs> and let's see. So this is me getting up at six, you know, we're, we're on the touring thing, getting up six, doing my first workout, doing this, going, going to the rehearsal room, figuring this out, being able to sing like this. You know, we all sing in the band and every, everyone does that, but we've worked at it. We constantly yeah. work at it. And then, and then the playing, which keeps getting better. I mean, even, and, and, Bless Joe Satriani and John Petrucci. They just raised my playing <laughs> to no end. Just being with them every day. I was like, fuck, these guys are awesome. And just being on stage with them, they're so humble. And 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 I got so much out of it. I, I learned so much mm. from standing with John there and Joe there. No one was showing off. We were trying to inspire each other. And it was just beautiful. I mean, but it made my playing just go up. And, and the same thing with, with vocals, you know, when, when you meet Mark, if, you, if you've ever been in a studio with someone who is that far advanced, like when Mutt Langer goes in the room, when he does backing vocals, his first take, he can hit anything, high, low, all the vocals that are like Love Bites, for example, that's all of him. We're in All those, that's actually one of my favorite Def Leppard songs. That's all yeah. him. All the backing, the main ones, we're in there a little bit, but the, the main stuff is him, you know, you, you hear him on, all the Shania Twain stuff, back in back in black, Highway to Hell, and the, the chorus, Highway to Hell. There, there's Mutt. Um, the foreigner stuff. You you just hear him all the time. The cars. I hear him every day on the radio, <laughs> and um, <laughs> he's just got the best voice. And and some people find it intimidating. I mean, I don't because he's not coming from that place. Sure. But um, yeah, you you get in there and 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 there's this this excellence that that he's worked at and it's like second nature to him but he put so much into it so you know when i've had friends and they've come down they go fuck i had no idea that you do this every day and and it's like yeah and and to get to that it it takes this and it's not any of us being big edit or anything it's just saying again for the level of excellence you have to put that much in and going back to the stevie wonder thing you know he had a, a period where he was just it would ooze, you know, so like Hendrix, you know, you know, then you people, they've, uh, they're, they're doing three paint, four paints, one with each foot and everything. They're being channeled and that. I think Hendrix was like that. I think, you know, probably Beethoven was like that. Mm. I think Stevie Wonder was like that. And, you know, th- there's only a period. And then all of a sudden it goes, the window closes, you know, Lennon McCartney. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, after a while it, it closes, but there's a inspirational, um, spirit or something that comes in and allows you to do that and and if if you're if you can get a glimpse of it then you have to hold on to it and you have to uh be respectful of it and and you have to give everything you've got because you've been honored with this this great gift that's how i look at it yeah, and, and we do and it kind of it, it kind of works you know i think people a lot of times they, they think uh, you know what you do is easy or uh, they see the 90 minutes yes yeah. But they don't understand what it took to get there. It took just as much to get there as the top, you know, cardiac surgeon in a hospital. Right. To get to his, it's just you're doing different stuff. But yeah, a- a- any I, level. I, I, yeah. I read, there was a thing, there was these, um, it, it was someone in the Olympics and they said, well, I haven't had a cheat day in four years. Wow. So, so you, and that's the kind of thing, you know, and, and, and to, to be that, I think that you've, yeah, you you owe it to it. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't want to just do it kind of half heartedly. No, I agree. We, you know, it's very it's cool, that. man. I love what you said too about how you were happy you came from London. And I quote this in the book: "You said you take some of it with you wherever you go. It's an attitude, confidence thing." Again, I totally vibe with that. Being from the Bronx and New York City, absolutely. It, you know, if it gives you, for me, I like uh, your ability to get out of the foxhole alive may just be a little greater than the next guy. Right. Do you sort of feel yeah. like that? Without a doubt. Yeah. Without yeah. A doubt. It, it, especially like you had sort of, and same me with a, bl- a blue collar, what you call yeah. here in the States now, you know, blue collar background. And, yeah. um, you know, do you, you still feel this way, even though you've been here for 30 years, I'd imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, my wife's from Brooklyn. Right. And the, the mother of my other two girls, she's from the Bronx. Right. And, and there's there's something in there that's there's just a natural thing, you know, that, that kind of, um, I don't know, well, you know. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. The thing. It goes with it. It's, a, you, it's, a, it's a, a, little, a little gift, actually, especially when you get out in the world because other people don't, they don't see stuff. You, you know? know what? 
That, I agree. I think it's a gift too. I always view and I'm always grateful for. It. I mean, you have a lot of shit that you got to do, like everything else. You, you got to go yeah. through a lot of shit to earn that gift. But it is, it, it's a little bit of an edge or something. But yeah, you could always, and when you're talking to someone else who's got it, it's like, okay, there's always like simpatico there Absolutely. with that it, kind it, of thing. It's a big sense. I mean, there's definitely something from, from living in a big city that yeah. you can't, kind of, yeah, that, that, that's that you're grateful for. Oh. You know? Totally, man. In the mid seventies, you paid sixty six quid, which is like sixty six dollars back then. <laughs> Round trip, yeah. Uh, was that Freddie Laker or something like that? It was Laker. <laughs> he done it first, Freddie Laker. Then uh, I think British Airways. Everyone was going, "Hang on a minute, we better jump in on this." So they all done it for a while. <laughs> well, yeah. I wish you can get that deal now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then then it was a Greyhound bus. You know, we we got to. New York, and then it was right across the country on a Greyhound bus, which was amazing. That's, I was 19. And that's, it's, you know, I'd always been um, a fan of American pop culture, e- everything. You know, the reason we sing with American accents is that thing I said before, yeah. you know, because we, um, we learned from the Beach Boys, Chuck Berry, you know, Rita Franklin, the, everyone American, you know, the Everly Brothers, Elvis, you know, uh, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder. And, and that that's how you sung – pop music or rock and roll or blues or soul or whatever. So you copied it. And then all of a sudden we had American accents when we sing. So I, I didn't realize that at first, but also the same with movies. You know, we, we would get all of the, the Westerns and the, the, the great stuff. And it was part of our culture. Uh, and, the, you know, a lot of people go, well, how come British actors can do American accents and, and not the other way around? And I think that's the reason. It's changing now, obviously, but... Uh, that, that's why, because we were so kind of deeply entrenched in American culture. And, and it was, uh, so for me coming to America for the first time was, was brilliant. It was a, it was kind of culture shocking, but not really. Cause I, that's kind of what I expected. I remember getting out in New York going, fuck these buildings. They're real skyscrapers. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> it was, it was awesome. Oh, and pancake. Oh, the food portions. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. England were like this, you know, obviously, and everything was like, wow, and and got bigger since, you know. Dude, let me tell you a funny story about that. 1993, I go to my wife's house in Dunstable, first time to meet her mom. Right. She 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 puts on the table a like salad with a can of salmon on top of it, like salmon salad, right? So she puts yeah. it in front of me. And as it is, you know, her family, they're very typically British. They're all quiet. You know, they're looking at me like I'm a fucking new puppy or something, right? So uh, she puts this bowl in front of me and I start eating. And then all of a sudden, the whole mood gets like really weird. So I, I look at my wife like, what did I do wrong? And she said, that's everybody's food. Oh, no, <laughs> no fucking right. That's brilliant. That is so easy. And the fact that they didn't say anything. Right, right. Yeah, that's brilliant. That was, but that's what it reminded me of because the portions here, my wife's always saying that you don't realize how big I, I do because I've been back there now. The portions are so big. That's <laughs> funny when you said that, man. And I'm munching right. away on this shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your first touring band, Girl, you opened up for UFO. I was wondering, like, was Schenker in the band then? Who was guitar playing then? And he wasn't. Paul Chapman was, but I, I've since you know met with Michael many times and played with him. You know, we actually you know done. Um, he, he toured. His MSG opened up for Def Leppard at one point on the Asteria tour. But no, it was it was Paul Chapman who, who. And this is really interesting as well. Paul was always a great player. He actually replaced Gary Moore in a band called Skid Row. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, over in Ireland, yeah, I think. Right? Skid Row, not yeah. the American. The end. Uh, oh, yeah, and. He, so he was that guy, you know, he's, he's one of them guys who you can, he can play anything. So what's interesting about Paul Chapman, he actually went away for a few years and I, and then I sat down and, and played with him and he was doing all this Ingvay stuff. And I'm like, fuck, where, where did that come from? <laughs> he, said, he said, well, I teach now. You know, I'm like, what? So you do all these, you know, these crazy arpeggios and these like, you know, Phrygian dominant runs and all of this crazy shit. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so but he was always just a really great player so that that was great and we learned so much from them guys they were like big brothers to us because we've done like three tours with them That's cool. and the very first tour was was a tour of europe and they'd be like wow this is this is great that's so cool man i there's a there's a great um I, again richie blackmore story you know i i met richie um 
he came down to the marquee and was I, what it was was my girlfriend at the time, Liz. He it was absolutely gorgeous. He was like, "Fuck!" Um, so, and then she's talking. He came over to her and she said, "Why don't you go and play with my boyfriend's band?" He said, "Okay." So he came <laughs> up, came up, and, and we we played at the marquee. And then afterwards, that they were playing, so we went back with Richie, and I had the most amazing open discussion about guitar play. It's something you always wish for. This is your. This is why I started playing guitar because Richie Blackmore and we sat down at, at this bar in this hotel and we geeked out on guitars and he was just like giving me advice and, and just stuff. And then Michael Schenker walked in and he went, now that's a good player. Wow. Said, and, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is so cool. And, and you know, I knew, knew Michael from back then cause he'd always be around. So yeah, I was, I was very familiar with that, but I, I thought there was a great story and, and, and Richie was again, in that context, so humble and, and just exactly what you want him to be, what you want your idol to be. Right, right. So I've, I've had such great luck with, with people I really respect, you know, like I met Prince and I met Sting and you hear all these horror stories about their personality, but the day I got them, they were just wonderful. So you, you, you go back and you go, wow, that, that's really cool. Yeah, and that's, your, that's what you retain and that's what you want to retain. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Gary Moore, what was playing with Gary like, and what was that Peter Green Les Paul like to play? It it was really so. We we were doing the Pyromania tour. Um, uh, Gary was opening up. He had Neil Murray on bass. I forget who the band was, but you know he was playing great, and and he had the pink the salmon pink strat and that Les Paul. And you, you could hear it, and and then backstage I went, oh, "Fuck that Les Paul sounds amazing." And he goes, "Want to play it?" And I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> So we sat there for an hour. He, he picked up a Charvel and, and we jammed and, and I, I, I got a blister because it was just, you know, watching him play, doing all these licks that you, I've tried to work out before and then you see him doing it. You know, we, we, me and Steve Clark had, had a similar thing with Jan Ackerman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From he just focus. came in the studio while we, when we was doing Hysteria. And he sat down and he goes, oh, okay, and just picked up a guitar and started playing. And we're like, we're watching him. <laughs> and it's the same with Gary, you know. I, I, Gary is, is the feel, you know, the, yeah. when he plays blues, like the, the vibrato and everything, just beautiful. And, and the fact that he could just do anything, just rip all over the place. So it was brilliant. And it also inspired me to start using heavier gauge strings. So I was using nines. He had tens on that. And then after that, each tour got kind of progressively heavier because it was it, there was a, a – a fuck offness and, and power you could you could really hit the guitar hard a li- little bit like a punk thing really yeah. like just slam it and and then you know once you get your stringers fingers get stronger you can you can bend anything and it's uh it, it was cool but that's what started it off and it was just wonderful to be you know again with one of my idols sitting there and, and jamming with him you know on that guitar what was that guitar like it was beautiful i mean a lot of 59s I like that. Larry dimarzio has got one and it's, it's the same. It's just like you pick one up and you go, whoa, uh, Bernie Marsden, who, yeah. who was in White Snake. Snake. Got, he brought one, not the last tour of England, the, the one before he brought it backstage and, and let me play that. And same deal. They, they've, they've all got a, a, a thing. The necks are all the same, the big chunky neck. Yeah. And, and it's, it's your favorite Les Paul. It's like what you'd want a Les Paul to be like. It's like the dream of, of your Les Paul. And, that, and that's what they're like. Did you notice a difference with the pickups? Because everybody, that's the thing or you hear about that they're... You know. I didn't plug them all in. Only only the Peter Green one, the Gary Moore one. That, that was the only one I actually played through an amp. And I, I was I was more... It, it, I didn't notice a difference. You know, like I said, I, I, I put DiMarzio's on everything. So yeah. even, even um, some of the other stuff that, that I want to sound more... I'd, have, I'd put a PAF on. I think it represents what you have in your head. You know, I've always found that with Demasios. I've got this uh, old 70s Ibanez knockoff of a Flying V, and we put a, a PAF on the, on the thing, and it's like, that's the sound. Right. You know, it sounds like Schenker, really. You know, you've got that that thing, it kind of dials that up. So I, I'm so familiar with the Demasio stuff, that, but I think it's that. I think that when you play a Les Paul like that, it, that's how it's supposed to sound. Yeah. And I, with 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 those ones, I, I, like I said, I was I was more geeking out the fact that it was Gary Moore sitting there. And it, was, <laughs> it just felt great, you know. Really sad. He was such a talented, talented guy. Oh, I mean, just beautiful player, man. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't hit his 
full stride, I don't think. You know, I don't think people really recognised him yet. And I think if it had he had gone on, he probably would have. You know, it's a uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, man. Um, in in seventy nine, in your book, you said that's when you first tried coke and then you were hitting the booze and other stuff pretty hard and then you quit cold turkey pretty much in the mid 80s um i have a couple of questions if you're are you comfortable talking about that yeah okay cool yeah. so what was rock bottom or for you what was the trigger for you to just seriously consider sobriety um blacking out and not remembering anything that that was the thing i remember driving i remember me and steve clark got so mortally wounded drunk once in <laughs> and, that, uh, and I mortally, saw in Joe's car. Yeah. Mortally wounded. <laughs> yeah. I saw in Joe's car. We were out <laughs> driving. We were fucked up. And, and I, I got back, left his car with the doors open, radio on. And I thought, apart from being a dick, you know, it, it's so irresponsible driving yeah. like that. So that was the thing. I didn't remember it. And I thought, oh, this is, this is not cool. And it started getting progressively worse. So I, I was like, you know what? I, I'm not going to do this because it's I don't like where people like that end up. So I I, I was I, I stopped and then I tried social drinking, and that didn't really work. You know, the, the glass of wine here and there didn't didn't work. It was like Jack Daniels by the end of the week. Right. And then literally uh, the full actually what is, what's the date today? Eleventh. So in in four days time it would be thirty two years. Dude, congratulations! Um, I was with my thank you. That was my so fucking Liz. cool. Thank you. The, the the girl that I was saying, um, you know, was with, with Richie Blackmore when we came in and, and when Richie saw her. So, yeah, we were in Paris and I said, you know what? I'm not going to drink after this. So we had a glass of champagne on her birthday, which is the 14th of April. And I said, I'm not going to do any more after this. I'm not, I'm not drinking at all. And that was it. So yeah, that, that was that, uh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. But it's like when you stop, it was different. I know some people can't stop. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a very uh, addictive thing. I, I, I stop drinking coffee every now and again, You're just to clean out and do a, do a thing. Um, but obviously that's a lot harder. You know, it's a different thing. And, and God knows when people do drugs or, you know, the opiates. And yeah, yeah. Things on there. So I was, I was just fortunate. I don't know if it's a willpower thing. I, I don't know. I was just, just lucky, but I was, I was able to do that. And I think that the one thing I noticed with a lot of people is that there's they get peer pressured. It's like peer pressured into smoking at school. It's peer pressured into drinking and trying to be cool. I never really cared about that. I don't give a fuck what anyone actually thinks. So the, the peer pressure thing didn't really affect. So I took that out of the equation and it was just really down to a, a physical dependency. And, and, you know, after about two weeks, I was able to feel okay. And the only thing I noticed, I was, I was a bit bored when I stopped drinking. I was like, Oh my God, this is, Cause that's your thing, man. Cause when, yeah, yeah, right? so now you fuck, what do I do with this time? That's yeah. why people go back to drinking. Right. So then I, when I started working out, I started running, actually okay. I started jogging and, and then that led to saying else. And that filled that void. And then okay. before you know, I've got another addiction, only a healthier one. So, and that, that was it really. And I, thank God I was able to do that. And yeah. like Steve wasn't, you know, yeah. we, we would sit and discuss this shit for hours, you know, even when I'd stopped drinking, We'd go out, and I remember we were sitting in a bar for six hours once, me and Steve, and, and I was on Perrier's, and he was drinking, sipping beers. He wasn't getting loaded or anything, and uh, we would just be talking about that whole thing. And uh, he's like, "Man, I, I just I keep trying, but I, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do this. What you're doing?" It's, uh, so yeah, that was that was that was scary. And, and actually, when I realised that he couldn't, that was actually even scarier. You probably. I would imagine it made you feel pretty grateful. It, it really did. Yeah. It did. I just, I felt so shitty for Steve, but um, I think there's a, there's a Hoover in the background there. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. Um, Is that yeah, a Hoover? No, it, it, there's certain it, English things, what you just said, that's like a very English thing to say. Hoover. It, well, yeah, because yeah. America would say, oh, you know, the vacuum's on or whatever. It's just those little differences. Isn't that weird? But I've been here so long. I'm. I, it's like thirty something years. It's so weird that well, I still do that. My yeah. wife's been here thirty something, probably thirty one years. Same thing. Really? Uh, <laughs> same exact thing. And she still eats beans on toast, man. Well, that's that's a luxury. That's fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the best thing in the world. It, it is pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, it, I have. 
I've had so many people come on this show and talk about getting sober, and I'm real comfortable. I've had people in my life that have had, you know, addicts that have gotten sober and have not. Yeah. Um, so I'm, and I, so I get it. Um, I had it. What happened is, and I started getting so many emails and messages from people that were struggling, and they said, "I really appreciate these, you know, interviews." So I, you know, we publish these on YouTube, the audio, and I have a separate. Yeah playlist now for people musicians who got sober for these people who are struggling what is like maybe the biggest difference or the huge difference in your life between now and then um i take it a lot more seriously i i i, I put the career and me above my habit if that makes sense i i actually before it was it was something that was kind of um stopping me be a, a success i don't i don't mean the band and the success i'm talking about personal success yeah it i i saw this as this fucking demon trying to fuck with me i'm going no i'm, I'm I absolutely really that's pathetic so I, I that was the main thing it was like i'm not going to let that turn me into it, it stops my full potential this thing, whatever it was, and yeah. it's like, it was pretty lame. And I thought that, it, you know, I've got to be at least be above that. And so that's how I was able to stop. And I, like I said, I, I did have an alternative and, and I know music is a great alternative, but it, you, it's, it's a different thing when you do something physical and, and that gets you out the house and gets you into a, a, a different um, dimension, if you like, that really helps. So I, I think that it, it's really good if you, you it can do something that, that is physical, that's out of your norm. Because it's so easy to just sit down. I remember sitting down writing songs and, and, and having a drink and, and it, it being cool and that. So you, that still kind of can go hand in hand with that. But the minute I broke and done something physical, it allowed me to come back to that part of, of songwriting or playing and then and doing it totally stone cold sober. And then it actually felt better. It was like, wow, it's cool. I can actually, I'm more coherent. I can think better. I can play better. You know, despite the whole thing when people go, yeah, but when you're fucked up, you get these ideas. No, <laughs> just, you know yeah, I mean? you get a lot of fucking ideas. Most of them are not That's good ones. They're bullshit. You know, I, I played it back. I remember we, we played somewhere once. Oh, yeah, we jammed it. It was all drunk. It was awesome, man. Then someone played it back, and it's like, <laughs> this is the worst guitarist I've ever heard in, in my life. And it's me. And it's, you, you know, all of that stuff. So, yeah. So. <laughs> oh, man. What, what did you do, like, um, the first tour you had where you weren't drinking because that to me that's where the work you know the work of staying sober comes in you know what did how did you like what were coping skills did you have at that point to- so, so I remember it, it distinctly well we played Hammersmith Odeon in, in England we just released Hysteria and it, it, the album had gone in at I think number one or something and the, the single we had a top our first top 10 single with Animal and um and it was slow in the states but it it, it was kicking in in the uk so we did that we played amos Odeon, and i went on stage and i thought jesus this is a bit dull i feel i don't feel kind of cool and i was 29 i remember I was, I was 29 thinking well i'm probably a bit old for this now that's why i probably feel like this and it's like <laughs> this is bullshit <laughs> that's because you ain't got over this dependency on this alcohol and I just and I, I thought to myself, fucking get over that, you pussy. It was like, really, it was the woe is me. I don't feel that inspired. And and not that I was faking it or anything, but I started really enjoying performing, and a swagger came came back, and or actually even more so later on. You know, I got more confident in myself. Sure. And, and I didn't have this. Um, veil of haze what over it you know it just affected me one way or another like yeah. uh, mentally emotionally or whatever whatever else it was really good that i got it out of the way but i, I do remember thinking that i remember got on stage and i was like it's just because i'm old now i'm 29 it was like, <laughs> it's funny how you so, think when you're 29 right isn't it <laughs> well it is considering we we just you know i was playing in england on my on my 61st birthday and i was like fuck i feel like a young kid it was so right. weird i felt like I was 29 then and I felt like I was 61 when I was 29 so that's the the, that's the river really cool man Thanks. that's really cool um so like one of the things I get out of you is that to some extent righteous 
indignation has really motivated you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm like so exactly like that. Um, we, and it's a blessing and a curse. But wh- where did that that come from with for you? Um, I, I think where that come from, and uh, you're going back to the parents and that, you know, I, I was mm. an asthmatic when I was a kid and I'd be like wheezing. My mum had scarlet fever, alopecia, eczema, asthma, all of these like nervy complaints. And I think I inherited them. I in- inherited asthma uh, uh, as a learned thing. I, I know it's a physical thing and it scars your lungs and all of that stuff. I, I, I'm totally cool with that. But I think that the, she would get stressed and one of the it would trigger this asthma or whatever so i kind of got that and i think that when i started playing guitar i was, I was you know we all, we all hear about you know all of a sudden you're expressing yourself it's very personal and and you you're not in someone else's world you're in your own dimension all of a sudden it's just amazing and and you you can control something yourself and i think there was a confidence that i absolutely got from that um that made that stuff go away, made the, the asthma go away. And, and it just uh, made me focus on other things. And I don't mean me personally, like as, a, as an ego thing, but actually allowed me to focus on something else that was really cool. And, and, and not just the playing, but the expression of playing, what that actually does, and then singing and writing, writing music, writing songs and stuff like that. It kind of, um, that artistic expression thing was just fucking magical. Yeah. And and that that's really what started that off, and then then the confidence came, and like I said, all these different things. You know, you you do what everyone else does. You get drunk, and da, 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 it becomes a bit of an issue. You then all of a sudden you get over, and you go, actually, hang on, I don't need that. That's 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 kind of it's a it's dragging me back. And then when you get over that, and you 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 become um, the expression becomes really important and you don't need all that stuff because you, you realize it, it is actually dragging you down. Then, then the confidence is what, what leads you. And I don't mean being big headed or, or egoed out. It's just as a, an inner confidence that allows you to, to kind of, um, Oh, to be free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's, I don't take it like sure. you're it's nothing big headed. Yeah. No, it's like, you gotta fucking take care of yourself to have a life, yeah. man. You, you can't yeah. like, so when you got out of that environment too, you, the, whatever the stressors were in there, that was that you were basically taking on your mom's stress or whatever. Yeah. That yeah. was probably freed you up a lot as well. Big time. Yeah. Big time. But I, again, you know, like, like the booze thing, I had something else to focus on that was, that was a real positive. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, you know, the, you, you know, we, we, you know, at school, you know, kids really need to be able to get out and express themselves, especially now. I, you know, my, I was just with my 14 year old daughter the other day and, you know, she's going through a thing and it, it's really interesting. They're so uh, shy and, you know, they, they text and they do all this stuff and they don't really have the social interaction like we did oh so, it's and it terrible affects, man it's, it's awful it's terrible because they yeah. think they think you know they call it quote social media there's no yeah. fucking social skills whatsoever Absolutely. developed Absolutely. from that Absolutely. zero and, and it's funny and I, I don't know if you have experiences with your kids my two sons they're tw- uh, 28 almost 29 and 27 my daughter's 19 and my older son came to me because you know i'm really glad i didn't grow up in sam's my daughter's <laughs> age because oh I, her name's sam as well yeah 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 yeah, yeah my daughter's name is sam <laughs> well. I noticed that. and uh he said because i learned how to talk to people dad right and i'm so happy and i see all these because like you know they'll come they do you have this they come over and there's three girls sitting in the house and they're all on the phone with somebody Absolutely. else yes. three of them and, and there's nobody talking to each other i'm like right. what the it's fascinating why are you here i'm thinking i don't say that why are you here why don't you do this like yeah, you, in, a, you know, do, in another house. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're here. Well, I don't. You, I don't know. Crazy thing. Hang out and talk. I don't know. It's like what a concept. Yeah, you imagine that. Yeah, but it's it's terrible, man, with the social or the lack of socialization. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I was really happy in the book that you got to connect with your dad before he passed, and it seemed like that was a very um, meaningful chapter. And it, I got the sense from reading that it gave you some sort of closure. Definitely. You know, I, I honestly think that the best time I ever had with my dad was that period, that two months when, when he was dying, because it was just wide open. It was like, and everything from, from him not being out, from being in bed and going to the toilet and him going, 
I said, look, fuck, I can wipe your ass if you want. He's like, sure. oh, no, 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 no. Then he said, actually, could you do that at some point? And I, it was it was great. I know yeah, yeah, yeah. I think to talk about, but, you know, I actually felt you know, all of this, this whole life had just come to that moment where I could help him. Yeah, that's really know? cool. When he asked me when, when he needed it. And uh, that was cool. And we, we laughed our asses off. And we, we just, he just really, my dad was actually um, really getting it towards later on in life he was just kind of opening up and it was um and if he had you know if the cancer hadn't got him he'd have been just he'd have been 90 something now it would have been cool though i think he'd have uh, just been uh, wide open and, and kind of a, a bit more kind of um because he was learning all this stuff as we was going along he was really getting that that experience you know and uh, so yeah unfortunately that that kind of got him well i was glad you got to do that you could tell that it was like a big weight you know yeah. reading the book you could get the sense that it was a very important thing and that you 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 felt i could i got the sense that if had you not been able to do that there would have been a tremendous amount of remorse and I'm, i was really Definitely. glad yeah that's oh, cool that, absolutely yeah well, you, you mentioned that opening up you grew up in a pretty like blue collar environment yet yeah. from what i've read and obviously talking to you man you're very open you're well read intelligent did that come later or did that come really late i i mean i'm i'm at such a um a real late start and i think um i actually it was really funny when well, not funny but when when 911 happened i i wasn't i wanted to find out what had happened i, I was like well, I, I didn't really understand it so i i started doing research on on why something who would do it and all the stuff going on. And obviously it's a really complicated thing but um it just opened me up and and then I started reading more other stuff and it just started becoming more cultured. I actually remember going back to England and recognizing London for the first time. I'd walk around and, and see the architecture and go, fuck. You, yeah, you talk about shit. that in your book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I missed it. And I, was, I was growing up there, seeing it every day. And then when, when you come a little bit more inspired or, or the intelligence kind of gets activated then then you start noticing things like that and it hasn't stopped and and that's kind of what i was saying about my dad he was just his his intelligence had just been activated like probably the, the last five years of his life he just started opening up and with me it's it's just never ending i, I find it fascinating and i, I get a almost um artistic like thrill out of it yeah because every day yeah, there's there's something out there that's fascinating you meet people you have conversation you you see something artistic or you hear something you read you it's wide open and it's i, I find it fascinating especially the world at the moment the way it is it's uh it's still unbelievable and, and you're st still discovering shit every single day it's amazing yeah that's really good so i'm, I'm a, i would imagine you feel proud of that not like big headed but you probably you got to have a sense of satisfaction but you I, know I when do. you look at where you came from where you are now i mean that's a big fucking leap you know intellectually and mentally yeah yeah, because mm -hmm. growing up, it was it was kind of closed. My mum and dad didn't really speak to each other. There was so mm -hmm. much that they missed, and I noticed that. And and so, not because they did it, I I didn't. But I, I you you just notice. You take mental notes, yeah. and and then you apply them to your own situation. And then all, before you know it, you're and always going you're work in progress. You're yeah, totally yeah, work in totally. progress, and it 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 really helps. It's it's amazing the experience factor of it you know oh, good on you man it's awesome i want to talk about uh delta deep that's another project you have that i want to turn people on to i don't know if people know about that so phil's in a band called delta deep it's a really killer blues band um it's got two albums out uh i'm a blues guy like i said and so i, I really loved it um talk about how you put the record together or the this the band together just to turn people on to them because i want people to listen um well Debbie Blackwell Cook, who's uh, Helen, my wife's Helen's godmother, and she's known her for years, has this amazing voice. And she actually sung at our wedding. She'd done a Ella Fitzgerald song and uh, done it um, a cappella. And I was like, wow, this is great. So she'd be around the house. I'd, I've got guitars in every room. I'd pick it up. We'd be playing. We'd be doing The Temptations. It'd be uh, Aretha Franklin, something. We'd goof off and something. It's like, well, sounds pretty cool. Uh, and then Helen said, oh, you should do Muddy Water Blues by by um, uh, Paul Rogers. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard that song. I don't know that song. No, I know Paul's oh, voice. Awesome. God. Like, it's, so it's really cool. So we, we did that and we done um, 
the Gerson Institute, which is uh, I know that. Yeah. We we done a thing. We actually auctioned off a guitar and, and the proceeds we gave to the Gerson Institute. And uh, we went down there. Charlotte Gerson just passed away actually this year. She was ninety five, I think. But her story is fascinating. Her, her dad was um, her and her dad were in, in Nazi Germany, and he he had invented juice therapy. So he had all these uh, tuberculosis uh, patients, and um, he cured like he had like almost 60 of them and he cured like 50 odd with with this juice therapy and everyone's like, oh. anyway three of them had cancer and it actually had an effect on their tumors shrinking so anyway so years later they they, they had to leave germany because it was obviously not it was all going off down there so they uh they moved to the states and um anyway so she carried on with this this thing until she just passed away we we done this um we went down there and performed, you know, me and, me and Debbie done this acoustic stuff. And, uh, because of that, it was like, everyone's going, well, what, what, can we buy this? Can we buy this? And we said, well, no, <laughs> we haven't, well, I guess we should start to, doing some recording. So we actually started writing a few songs and, uh, before you know it, that, that's what it was. And they, they were based on, you know, it was kind of hard blues, e- even lyrically. It was about just different things. Yeah. yeah. And that bang the lid was, was about, you know, slavery and, and down in the Delta was, was a you know, metaphor for that as well. And something I couldn't do as a white person, but you know, we, we'd be singing this stuff. It was like just amazing. Yeah. And the, the actually, even the, the sound of the stuff and, and what the subject that was about was, was actually pretty cool. So, um, we started recording. Um, I, I got in touch with, um, Forrest Robinson, this, this amazing drummer. He used to play with India RE and he was with Joe Sample and the Crusaders and he, he, he been in Atlanta doing the, all the hip hop sessions and that. And I played it to him at Rick Allen's, I want to say 50th birthday party. And he's like, Oh my God, this is great. I have to be the drummer. I'm like, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, and with that, so we got me, Debbie and Forrest. And then um, Chris Hepton, who, who I'd done the book with, uh, he said, Oh man, you should, you should meet Robert DeLeo. He's, he's a Motown disciple. He's, he's kind of, uh, that's how he, he he loves it. I said, really? I said, yeah. So he got me in touch with with Robert, awesome person, and and just the most amazing bass player. So we got together, we started playing. It was like, fuck, this is awesome. So we done the first album, we toured it. We we done a, a East Coast and a West Coast version, uh, which was so much fun. Uh, and then recorded, I, I think, it was one of the ones in in uh, it was Daryl's house on on the East Coast. I was going to ask you that. Okay, upstate New York. Yeah. Okay. So it, what a great little venue. And they yeah. put all this focus right stuff in there. We recorded it. And we was going to use different songs from, from different performances. We recorded everything. But that night, it, ju- it just had a thing. So we, we put that out as an album. That's our second album, you know, that's East great. Coast Live. So, uh, and that's really it. And we've been working on songs. And um, the Def Leppard machine has got so, it's exploded. You know, it's got so busy. So, I think what I'm going to do is is some of the Delta Deep songs is is do a solo album because it'd be a lot easier and quicker for me to be able to get that together uh, and put some of the instrumental stuff, some of this other stuff that I've floating around, um, and and actually do a, an album that, that would represent me, you know. In That's all awesome. Man. Um, so I think I'm going to do that. So uh, uh, again, we're going to try and get some guests on these. Uh, some of these songs, which uh, again, would be super cool. You know, it was cool when I read in the book, um, this is what I was, uh, uh, I, would, I dug this. You're when you were putting a, I don't know if it was Delta deep. It was some project. Maybe it was man Rays, And you were like, well, shit, man, we don't have a lot of money for this. We got to go low budget. And I was like, that was, you didn't, you, you didn't like, you know, well, I'm Phil Collins. Let me fund this shit out of this. And just, you know, you had that same, you know, like, you said you walk around the house shutting the lights off. That was yeah. my 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 I, my wife shuts the lights off. I'm always locking doors, you know. Um, uh, but that was really cool because you, you you were like very smart about it. You know, this is a standalone project. This is you know we got to yeah. make this survive or not. And you know, sure, I'm sure you put a little bit of whatever in, but it's not like you, you're gonna like travel around on a fucking private jet to right. No, that was really cool. I remember that. I probably mentioned that before, but I, me, Paul Cook, and his wife were in this transit van with all the, you know, Jenny was sitting in the front, 
me and Paul are in the back with all the drums. <laughs> and Paul goes, fuck, I never thought I'd be doing this again. You know, after the <laughs> Sex Pistols had, had broke up and, you know, I mean, Def Leppard and everything. And it's like, no, but it, it was awesome. That's it, good. It was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, that was very and cool. And the three-piece thing was was killer. i got to say, I'd, I'd never experienced that before, being the singer and the, and the guitar player. And the fact that you can go off on these, you know, the police are my favorite band. And the fact that you could just go off on a tangent and, and, and not worry about that. You go, well, we've got to come in for the chorus. Everyone's going to be singing. You, you can just go drag it out. And, you know, Hendrix was, I, I loved the fact that they used to just yeah. go off and do that thing. So this was cool in, in that respect as well. You know, back to, um, Delta D the song whiskey, man, I really, yeah. that was a great, one of my favorite songs on the record. Um, I understand you wrote it years earlier, but I had a few questions. Well, what's the backstory? And also, um, what do you, what guitar, guitar are you playing? I would, thought you're playing a Jackson, but it sounded like a Strat at times on there. On, on that song, yeah. Um, it was. A, I've got a 1954 one seven five. Oh, those are cool. Those those Gibsons with the uh, like semi hollow, I think. Or the yes, F -hole? it's a big acoustic. It's, yeah. it's a, yes, F hole and and one like a p90 type thing on on the the, the uh, neck pickup and uh it was awesome and i've also got a a 330 that i, I had in england i so the, all the licks and stuff the solo is obviously a, a, a jackson pc1 but the all the other all the licks and everything was was either the um 175 or the 330 that was all of that stuff and then the, what the song I, you know i i literally had this thing called mickey baker's jazz guitar and I got it when I was like 17 and learned all these chords and strung them together and wrote this song. And I just remember that that's what that was. And I, I just had the first line. Um, I forget what the first line is now, but I, I sung that to Debbie and said, this kind of got a jazzy feel. And she just took it. And, you know, her son had been murdered. He, he got yeah. shot. And uh, so she she wrote it about that, you know, and and that's that's what it became about. So it was uh, it was an interesting thing, you know. It took a long time coming, but you know, she it was it was good for her to to get that out. So she was just you know writing about that as well, and in in that context and in that environment, it kind of really worked, you know. Great song, man. And and uh, thank you. The other song, mistreated, was that you singing? Yeah, dude. Well, that's I think, uh, it's, it's mainly me, it's me and Debbie do all the, the vocals together. You know, I know David Coverdale was on one song and on 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 the album, on, on the uh, thing Joe Elliott sings, but uh, on, obviously on the live thing, it's me. So, yeah. It sounded great, man. Thanks. People need to check out your voice. It's very, very good. And I know, again, from reading the book, how much you've worked on it, you know, um, it, it, it paid off, man. It, was, it sounded great. Thanks. Tough question for you, man. Top three musical experiences you've had. Just go with a gut, you know, knee-jerk reaction. I guess seeing the first concert, you know, the Deep Purple thing, because that started it all off and that it, it blew me away. It was like earth shattering. And, and that's, you know, I pestered my mum and dad for a guitar. Um, I think the Hysteria album was was fascinating because we, we try to create something that didn't exist and, you know, went, you know, defied all logic. You know, the, the label, everyone was going, what the fuck's wrong with you? Why don't you just do an album? Why don't you just record it? And, and Mutt was going, no, let's do something special. Let's do something that that people are going to be talking about in twenty years. And here we are. And here you two yeah, yeah. And I, I, I really like that. So that whole experience was was fascinating. Um, I like the fact that um, we're having a, a, a Indian summer to our career and, and whatever's happening now. And and with me doing stuff like Delta Deep and, and Man Rays and all these other things, it really helps the experience it, it kind of helps me um get better as a musician and, and a, as an artist as well so i i think that we've all been putting that you know joe's got his, his album he's down and out stuff and we, we've all kind of learned and continue learning I, I actually think that the period right now and I, I can't really put it on a uh a specific incident but um just where we are right now just as as a band it's something I've been dreaming of for years is, is having this part two to a career based on the, the merit of us working our asses off and actually continuing to, to get better. And the fact that everyone else is just falling off, you know, bands are disappearing, they're calling it a day. And, and the, 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 because of our integrity, 
it's allowing us to to flourish. I think that that's just an amazing well, human experience, but I think also a musical experience oh, as well. Oh, hell yeah. It's all, and what you said, it's all the hard work. It's not like, you know, ra- it's, again, it's not random. It's like you've done yeah. X, Y, and Z to fucking make that machine keep going, Definitely. you know, and then it's paying off. That is great, man. I'm happy for all of you, man. Um, Thanks. I was amazed when I read that, like when Hysteria came out, you were all sitting there saying, I need, we need to sell 5 million copies to break even. Right. Holy shit. That was pretty daunting. Yeah, well, you know, it was weird. I, I didn't notice it until they, they gave us these breakdowns, like the, the, the recording costs. And I remember sitting in, in, in the studio and it had a breakdown. It had, I remember sundries. That was the thing that got me. And it said 20 grand. I'm like, Fuck! What was the sundry? What what does that mean? <laughs> Potato I mean, chips you know, and like, shit. <laughs> yeah, it was like sitting in the cafe. You know, when you'd come out the studio and you go, "I'll have a coffee," and and it's like fucking. Tw- I don't know. It's, it doesn't appear in eighty six or whatever it was. That was a fuck of a lot of money to just be in a coffee bar. Yeah, you know, I know it was there for years, but that's that's not the point. I was like, Ooh, and then it's like you know rental of of equipment and studio room and costs and then shipping and it's like oh my god crew and it's again it's stuff that people don't think of they go well yeah the label no you pay for you everything. pay for all that shit. yeah yeah they just let, it's just like getting a loan from the bank yeah and now you've got to pay it back so we um again that that was hard work doing that album but very fulfilling i gotta say it was rewarding even on, on a personal level you know we we all came out way better than we went in and that these these magical songs and this this sound that we didn't have before and 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 it became a benchmark to um certainly to a lot of other bands but even even other bands in different genres you know i heard pop stuff i heard r&b i you know stuff like boys to men and and that whole vocal thing you multi-tracked and it was like where we were it was uh it was it was really cool to be able to to hear that in other artists and um so we had all this, so that was worthwhile, but it was just making the money back. And we put the album out and it kind of stalled. It, it didn't quite do it initially. And then Pour Some Sugar On Me came out as a full single. And then, bang, it all, it all went off. It was crazy. That was so cool reading that, man. It was really good. Um, If you had to go back and give advice to young Phil, what advice would yeah. you have given yourself that would have made your life easier? If you would have listened. I kind of, I, I, I think I did all the stuff that I'd advise me to do. I just done it very slowly, I guess methodically. And I would have said, fuck speed that if you do this, this is a shortcut. I would have <laughs> done exactly what it was, but I, I'd have just kind of sped it up a little bit. Like I said, it's a slow start. I didn't, my, my intellect didn't get activated until yeah, 2001, I guess really, yeah. when, when, when the planes went into the building, I was like, fuck, I, I didn't understand it. And, and for me to, discover it because you know you, you're not going to notice it by by going watching the news or reading papers because it's it, you're just going to get a different slanted fact system so uh, what's really interesting I've, I've been doing a friend of mine turned me on to all these books they're called history in an hour and it's like world war one the russian revolution the civil war south africa uh, all, all of these things medieval england and you can read these books in an hour if you, if you speed read, but um, it's fascinating because nothing ever changes. It's almost like the same play, but with different actors. You know, it's like a, a broad, like the, the mouse trap. you know, Agatha Christie has been going for like, you know, 75 years or something stupid like that. And they've obviously had different casts and everything. The story is the same. This was like that. I, I'd read these books and go, wow. Uh, and, and you can, and what I was saying, you know, your intellect gets activated. It kind of a lot of things start making sense when when you when you look at these things and and realize, you know, what what's happening and the reasons that you know why a, a company would do this, why a CEO would do that, what lobbyists are for, and and you know what the end game is, and why a country would invade someone else, and all of these things they're all connected. And yeah. I think when you start researching, doing your own research, not someone else's, it, it 
it's fascinating what you uncover. But, Along those lines, you've got to feel good, like with the physical shape that you're in and your condition, because like if you look at your peers and, you know, we're pretty much the same age. Everybody's on fucking meds of some sort. Like when I go to the doctor, which is rare, almost never, they're like, uh, what, uh, what are you taking? I'm like, like, what do you mean? Well, what pills yeah. like vitamin C? I mean, I don't even know what it's a foreign question to me because you know, the medications yeah. I'm like, no, I don't take a medication, right? And like, <laughs> you know, I mean, and you like you're talking about all these things with fucking pharmaceutical companies, you know, not yeah. to get political. I mean, it's just crazy with the money that's going on and who's running the country, man. Absolutely, it's, it's like you know, get everyone sick so you can get everyone in into onto these drugs, right. get them onto into us. When this, this the opioid thing is crazy, yeah, but you know, obvious yeah. that, that that would happen and, yeah. and that people would get addicted to these narcotics. It's like crazy. Yeah. That's, that's what the war on drugs should be about. Oh, I agree with you. Not yeah. smoking weed. Um, you still have your first. Let's talk about gear for a few minutes. You have uh, you still have your first guitar, the SG, and then the Black Strat that you use on Hysteria. Yeah, I got them upstairs actually. Really, yeah. that is yeah. so cool. Do you ever play yeah. them? Either one of them? I do. I, I pull them out. Now, what's what's interesting? I, I just because we were just in England, I, I pulled my Ibanez Destroyer out, the one that I used on the records, and it's in all the videos. You know, Rock of Ages photograph falling, and I played it on those solos, and it sounds great. And I, I pulled this out, John Zocco, my tech. Yeah, I put some new strings on it. This fucking thing sounded incredible. So I am. Um, I used it on, on, on the British tour, you know, as a, one song, you know, just got it there. And it's now in Cleveland at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, oh, cool, cool, man. But um, those guitars, I, I dragged them. At the, the Strat has been through the ringer. It, it, had a, <laughs> it had a DiMarzio on it. Then it had a – we filled it in and, and put a, a, a Floyd in it because it had a Kayla in it. And that snapped off and the wood broke. And I took it to – Oh. Jackson and Mike Shannon, who's a genius, went, oh, fuck, I could fix that easy. <laughs> so he filled it in with wood, and, and then we put a Floyd back in, uh, put some DiMarzios on it. it it's, it's incredible. It still sounds amazing. So uh, even after all that surgery, it's, it's kind of <laughs> worth the treat. You know? And the SG is just amazing. And what's interesting about that, it was a SG200 that had two single coil pickups. It was an entry-level one. And even at the time, I, I was know, like they had those. 16. Yeah, they, they were they were weird. They were, um, but the the but it plays like an SG. It's it's great. But I had a, a Gibson humbucker put on it when I was sixteen, actually, and yeah, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, ah, yeah, there you go. That's the sound I'm after. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it's killer. That was really that was a very cool. Your parents that was it was probably a big sacrifice for them to do that. Huge. Back then. Yeah, that was very cool. Yeah. yeah, very nice, man. What what? Okay, so let me ask you like. This is like, I don't even know if you could answer this question. As far as what's your top three go-to guitars now? Not ones you have to use, but the ones you just like playing, even if you don't play them on the records. Um, it was one right here, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's get to that. There's this telly that I fucking love. That is, a, that is not what I thought you'd pull out, a telly. Really? Yeah, really? that's wild. So t- tell uh, me about that guitar. Well, I got it in... It's a 71 telly. I got it in 84 when we was doing Hysteria. And I kind of wrote the riff for um, Don't Shoot Shotgun on it. And we wanted it to kind of sound like the Stones. Uh-huh. And the guitar didn't quite sound. It's been over through the ringer. And I, I, Chris Fleming at, at Fender refretted it, done all this shit. And then we put a DiMarzio Super Distortion on it, it uh, you know, the, the single coil size one. And it's unbelievable. It's just like one of my. It, it sounds thick like a, a Gibson or something. And then, but again, you can you know roll, turn it down, and it sounds really like a telly. So you can do. It's great for playing like bluesy things, or it's just a great go-to guitar. It's got all the power and all the all the fire and everything, but it's got also the clarity. So I, I love that. Um, Obviously, PC one. I've got a lot of PC one. So. Yeah, what a man. How, yeah. how many? Is it ridiculous how many of those you have? Well, I do, but we keep updating them. Like the like now, we've got. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll pull one out. I've got um, a lot of my stuffs out on 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 the way to England right now for because we're going to start rehearsing there in in May. So uh, my main ones, you know, I've got a 
a couple of natural ones that are that are really awesome. But uh, there's this one. It's a, it's a black PC one. I don't, don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So yeah, that looks great. It's it's got the humbucker. That what is that one on top? That's not. Uh, that's a that's a sustainer, and that that's okay. a, a fully that's a that's a Floyd. It's a, all titanium. Um, so I, I do that. But what the new ones? I've, I've actually got one being made right now and it's um you know they bake the wood they put the the uh truss rod adjustment you know you, so you can wheel it instead of kind of uh yeah putting a, a key in there and doing all that shit yeah and and the yeah. wood because they bake it it ends up sounding like a, a a vintage guitar and it really does so and i have no stuff on it no kind of finish on it on a lot of these stuff the other go-to, one of my favorite ones now is I have a PC one, PC Supreme, which Jackson made me. That they're, um, I haven't got one of them around because they're they're on tour. They're on, they're on their way to to England. But um, big fat monster neck. It's the biggest neck they have actually ever made at Jackson or Fender. It's like you know an inch. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's it's huge. Um, and and it's got a Dimasio X2N on it, so it's just just full power. And I love playing that. That's one of my favourites right now. The uh, the other PC, you know, PC one that I was just playing, and the Extroyer, which is kind of looks like the Destroyer. And we keep updating that one. And I, I played that in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I also have a Walnut PC one right now that's got this new Dimasio pickup on. And if you get a chance to actually, I played it on. Um, Good morning, in America. We done it the other week, it, and that's that's got that new pickup on. That's kind of my main get, go-to guitar. Because already I've had it less than a year, and it it looks like it's been bad. It's been around <laughs> old coconut oil from my. I, I played it like five songs on on the set. So that between that and the Extroyer and this uh, Supreme, they're, they're the main ones. And that Telly, because I had that Telly on tour as well. How many guitars do you take on tour with you? typically almost 10 that's not that's almost. pretty reasonable it is and it I, really I, is i've got this fender acousta sonic which is fucking have you seen these things the, the new one yeah yeah i saw it they sound like a real acoustic so the, i've always felt it horrible when you compromise you put a sound buster in the thing and it just kills the sound dead on an acoustic so with this thing you can actually actually sound like a real acoustic thing it's, it's like playing a telly so that's that's pretty cool that's awesome man that's really reasonable 10 guitars man that's yeah like incredibly yeah. reasonable how, do you, how many do you have all together do you even know i don't because they're all over the place you know we have a lock up i've got some at home got some in england some at joe's house so they're, <laughs> they're, they're all over the place yeah well that's great man hey phil what's your favorite song that you wrote um and why it changes all the time, you know. Um, it you, usually like um, there's some, some cool stuff on the last Def Leppard album. Um, Energized was great, actually. But there, there's there's one song that um, that I did um, in Man Rays, and it was it was a kind of a reggae thing. It's called Close at You. It was uh, it, I love that the way that that came about, and it was uh, yeah, kind of a the personal thing but the sound of it actually it just it, it went somewhere else it's a reggae thing and i've done it almost like with spanish guitar years ago and just revisited it and there's some new delta deep stuff that again is going to be on the uh other album that's the, the yeah, solo record yeah so it's, that's going to be cool so it it, it varies you know it's all, all the time go oh, i like this one this week it's like a guitar you know <laughs> do you have a favorite song you like to play not really all, yeah. all of them you know it's it, they all complement each other and uh you know rocket's kind of cool and and it just and, and mainly for a, from a, a aesthetic kind of you know performance type thing we we just done it in england and we opened is that the first set oh, we've done women first and then rocket and then just looking out and just seeing what we did with the lights and everything it was just really cool as as a, as a performance so that's that's a different thing again you know when you when you play something for a, it, it, it's totally different i'm actually going to be playing with my friend's band um he is probably the best pianist i've ever seen he's like a a, a jazz player um, his name's scott wilkie 
And I've known him for years, and I, I knew he was a musician. This was really weird. And he said, oh, you should come and see me play. And then he said, okay. And I saw him at his gig, and he said, we're going to do a Chick career song now. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe he was playing like this. So I actually got him to play on the Tesla album. He, there's a song called um, We Can Rule the World, which is about my dad. It's about me and my dad. Oh, wow. Yeah, me and Brian, we started writing the song. He, he actually played me this chord sequence. I went, fuck. And then just started writing these lyrics and we, we kind of, you know, took it further. And, and that's really what it's about. And um, it, it kind of, it's got a, a, a real queen vocal, you know, thing about it. But we had, um, a, a, again, you know, I got Scott to play the piano on it because he's, he's just so sensitive and, and real when he plays the piano. So, uh, yeah, he's on the record. And I'm playing with his band. On the 28th, they're playing this kind of jazz lounge. Where? Um, uh, in uh, in California. It's uh, this place called Spagatini's. So I'm, I'm actually going to be – I'm learning the three songs I have already. I've played with them before. But uh, it's so different for me to do something like that. So that's really cool. That is you know, cool. Like a, he's a monster. It's like just scary. And he's such a nice guy that you, you wouldn't think that this comes out. I mean, I, I literally saw him – shredding on a piano you go shit oh my god wow. it's scary when you go out do you get mobbed or is it like no no, it's, no. no thank think never yeah. like, the odd person goes hey and and recently said oh you know yesterday at starbucks congratulations on the rock and roll a stranger and it's usually really respectful or oh that's like. cool yeah and uh same deal you know if i'm i mean Virginia with my daughter or, or in South Carolina with my other two daughters, occasionally someone will go, oh, shit, what are you doing here? And we'll come up to you and, and be be really cool, actually. It's That's nice. nice. Yeah, that yeah. is nice. Hey, tell me, uh, name a couple of players that you've enjoyed jamming with because God knows there's been hundreds. Well, yeah, obviously – right at the top would be Petrucci and Satriani because that, that was so <laughs> different to what I expected. You know, it's like we went, we would get off stage after we, we'd do like a, you know, a 30 minute jam every night, you know, on the G3 thing. And then we'd come off and we'd talk in the hallway. And this is like January, February, and it's fucking freezing outside. And we'd just get off and we would discuss what we were just playing. And then you'd get into Jimi Hendrix. And it was so cool. It was such a, a, a great buzz. And and when I saw John Petrucci just recently at NAM, he went, fuck, man, I really missed those discussions when we'd come off stage. That is and, very and, cool. Man. It was so cool. And it was, it was, you know, it'd be anecdotal. Someone would mention something, but it'd be about the playing. And, well, it was great when you pulled that out tonight. Where'd that come from? And you're like, shit, I don't know. And then obviously Joe would be crazy. You know, you, you, John <laughs> would play something first. I'd, I'd play something and then Joe would you go whoa and then we had this guy come up john finn do you, do you know john finn no outrageous just outrageous playing he actually um he is in boston he actually uh work, works at the college there and, and teaches and uh, again you know someone would come up and, and jam with us and it was never about a competition you go it was about absorbing this this other talent that's just playing and, and i loved that about it. it was it was a different kind of jamming it was it was like really cool because jamming can can get a, a, a bit you know a bit weird you know it's not it's not cool but uh that was great and obviously the gary moore thing was was incredible um i'm just trying to think um what other bands yeah it's, it's it don't get to do it much but uh when i do it's it's good when it's thoughtful and, and kind of real you know what i mean as opposed yeah. to just uh, drunk and stumbling around when, it, when it's someone that actually is doing something that's, that's kind of passionate. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah. As, like as opposed to dick measuring or absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's, yeah. yeah. Hey, man. Desert Island Discs top three knee jerk reaction. Uh, Aladdin Sane, David Bowie. Uh huh. Great record. Um. Uh, now. Hendrix, I don't know uh, whether the Cry of Love or the first the first album because of what it is, I guess. You know, it came out. It's like fuck, this is crazy. Um, Purple Rain's great, and and the Police. Well, I know it's four, but uh, I really liked Ghost in the Machine, but um, I think um, Synchronicity is probably a better album. I think that they, they, they hit their 
you know, commercial and, and kind of artistic thing. Like that, that was it, I think. So, yeah, probably synchronicity. I wasn't surprised when I heard Bowie because I know what a big influence he was on you. For, again, yeah. in your book, you talked about that. Um, we, we touched on this. What's the biggest challenge that you've had to deal with as far as becoming successful and moving out of the working class or the blue collar environment you came from? Um, well, that didn't stop. You see that, that the hard work never stopped. So it actually seemed the same. Hmm. The environment was different. And I, I never got in a band for chicks or for drugs or for this or for that. It was always about the, the reward of the music. And so I'd work the same as I did. Actually, I worked even harder, you know, the, the, you know, in the factory, you don't really want to be there. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you're working uh, begrudgingly. You're like, oh, fuck, I have to do this again. I was thinking, wow, this is horrific. Then I, I was a dispatch rider and deliver stuff on a motorcycle in London for, did that for three years. That was actually really cool. You know, I got to be out and you got to discover London, you know, driving and most of the time in gridlock or in really shitty English weather. But uh, again, <laughs> It was a, a really great um, experience, it, especially for my driving and driving and reaction s skills and, and all of that stuff. Um, so that that was really cool. But I, I when I started working, I, I, I musically, it was a, a, a blessing. It was it was so much fun. So I'd at least put that same amount of effort into the working, yeah. if not more, because you're doing it for a different reason. You're actually doing it for the, you know, the reward, the artistic reward you're getting out of doing this. It's sure. Like, it's amazing. And you're getting paid. I remember we got 30 quid a week when, when we first got our record deal with Girl, and that's nothing. It's like, what, 40 bucks or something. Yeah. So to me, that was massive success. All of a sudden, I'm getting paid for playing guitar, and that was that was huge. Yeah. Right. So I've, I've carried that on, and I, I know that Joe has – Sav worked on British Rail – yeah, Rick's the only one who, who never had a job. You know, he, um, he was so young. He, he was. Yeah. He actually was fifteen. He had to. Have, they were supposed to have a tutor when they went on tour <laughs> supporting ACDC, and he 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 didn't see the tutor. So uh, then all of a sudden, it, it kind of started getting busier, and and then all of a sudden, he, he couldn't have a job anyway because they're in the studio, and then you know I join, and then and then it's. And it never stopped from that point onwards. I, we released Pyromania, and um, we never stopped. We had one year off in 2010, but other than that, it um, it was surprising because it, you, you're working, you're working really hard, and then all of a sudden you have to work hard. You're on tour, and you're like, fuck. And I remember when we got our um, Diamond Award. For that was the first time we actually stopped in, in New York and, and took – stock of what had just happened and that was years after the event you know we, we got it for um for hysteria and and you'd, you'd look up in the room it's elton john billy joel guys from pink floyd jimmy page and you're like fuck you know this is this is a, a big deal and we actually didn't honestly didn't realize that until that moment then then you saw what the, the peers or like record sales wise and um we, we realized we hadn't stopped at all we'd just been going Rrr grinding it out but in a, in a good way you know being rewarded for, for, for grinding out it's great are you good now with like taking the break like when you're off you're off yeah yeah I, cool. I, yeah absolutely and I, I i totally see the importance of it you, you can get stressed out not just because of working too hard but just other stuff you know you have uh, physical things you have family things you have different dynamics working so that that can stress you out and yeah yeah, I think it's really important to go. I'm going to just be a, just going to eat crap and just lay there for however long. Usually less than a week. <laughs> Good for you. I don't think you're eating a lot of crap though. Um, what do you say the best decision you ever made? Uh, well, I, I think the stopping drinking was was a big deal because it allowed me to focus on what I really wanted to do, and I think that that would have it would have been such a distraction. I mean, it's bad enough as it is with distractions, but that was, it's so readily available, you know, alcohol and it's so glorified, especially in rock and roll, but it's such a, it's so, it, it can fuck you up. When, when you, when you see really successful people 
most of the time these days they, they don't indulge or no. it's something you know separate it you know um most important things that you've learned about yourself throughout life um that everything is temporary that that everything is temporary so uh, again that even goes with uh if it's not happening right now there's a good chance if you keep working at something it will pay off or, or something but you know even emotionally you know if you're going through some shitty stuff or some great stuff um there's probably shit saying shitty around the corner or the same <laughs> or, you know what i mean yeah, yeah. that's all temporary and, and i think that we we can't get too going oh well, this is great because then someone goes oh by the way you just come back from the doctors you've got this or oh, whatever you know yeah so, so it's yeah it's it's, it's it's all temporary so yeah just bear that in mind i think that that that'll serve everyone well then tough question what do you like most about yourself um that i'm learning all these things I, i'm fascinated with uh, what what these life experiences bring I, I like that i'm open enough to to let them in and and kind of apply them when they come in i i, I like that you know it'd be a real drag if but even musically, you know, and that's just a, a a metaphor for everything else. But you know, I can listen to it. I can listen to Chick Career. I can listen to Metallica or the Sex Pistols. I can listen to uh, Lady Gaga. You know, it's it's just different things or whatever. And it's um, I, I like what that affords you when when you let all that in. It kind of yeah, open minded. You know, again, you know, people go. I, I done this thing once, someone, a radio interview, they, they said, okay, so hard pack or soft pack? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> what is that? I said, well, I've never smoked in my life. I'm like cigarettes, what are they? Yeah, <laughs> beer or liquor. I said, uh, beer or, or spirits. I said, well, I don't drink. Um, white meat or red meat? I said, I'm a vegan. <laughs> oh, blonde or brunette? And it's like, I haven't been out with a, a, a white girl for 20 years so it's like you know every single one i fouled yeah. every, every kind of and, little yeah. thing so I, I thought that was not me being mr opposite but it was like it just funny it was just just re really fun and i like the fact that i'm allowed to be myself within all of this because so many people are not they're so affected by peer pressure well you, you um, said early on man and and Again, I totally relate that you said I don't give a fuck what people think, and I know it's not it's not in a confrontational way. Like you're not sure. looking to pick something with somebody, but really, it doesn't fucking matter. You know, it, it, if you like me, cool. If you don't, I, I, I that's cool. I hope you do. But if you don't, that's fine. You know, I totally get that, and I think there's yeah. a lot of, I, you know, that's a, a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that you don't really have to sweat out a lot of shit that a lot of people are doing. The curse is that you know your road may be a little tougher, but so what? You know. See, I, I don't think it is. I, I think there's, um, again, I've, I've met, you know, other, other, like black guys, black women and, and white people who are in mixed relationships and they go, well, shit, how do you deal with that? Is that, is that cool? They go, I've got a ton of shit from, from this. I said, really? Then, then you want to stop hanging out with those people. I, oh, yeah. I don't get, you know, four of my five children have black mothers and, and it's like, and it's awesome and it's great. And they're, they're brilliant. And I think that, that you know, if they, uh, have part of their black ancestry, part of their white ancestry, the good parts, then that's all that, that matters and, and the love. And and I, I think that's it. And if someone's a friend's going to be a, have a problem with that, then that they probably don't need to be a friend. And that's oh, how I look. Totally. You know yeah. what I mean? And it, uh, I've had that, you know, I've had that with, with, with other friends who, of, of mixed couple. They've, they've said, Are you, how do you deal with that? And I said, I don't, I, I've never, I, I don't have that. I don't have that problem. I don't have those set of problems. I know it's different and, you know, being of mixed race as, as a whole set of issues that come with that as it does with being black or, or whatever. So um, I'm, I'm, I totally respect that. But I think that um, me personally, I, I, it's just awesome. It's, it's just really good. And that, I, again, yeah, don't hang out with people who are, who are going to be that way. Yeah. Well, plus what, like, what would anybody's concern be about, like, I mean, honestly, why would someone care about who, what color your wife is? I'm not being funny or anything, but like, yeah, like, I, I, I agree. And I'd never <laughs> even heard of it, but some people are. <laughs> they've, they've said that why well, I, I, I've even had people go, Well, I don't believe in mixing races. And I'm like, Really? This is my, well, this is Samantha, or this is Savannah, this, yeah. this is my girl. 
this is little Jackson. You know, he's he's a person. He's a human being. He's, he's above all that. It's like he's part of the human race. That's how I always, and that's how I look at. It. I genuinely do. If, if so, if someone has a problem, it's their problem. It's oh, totally. absolutely mine. Yeah. So I, I I look at it like that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's like saying, Wait, that's- well, I mean, it's just that's no different than saying if you're married to a blonde, you know, why why don't you have a brunette wife? Yeah. Well, I mean, absolutely. like, like it's, it's just as crazy. Exactly like, the same. Like I agree. The, being upset. I just don't know why anybody would. It's like anybody's business who uh, it just seems, you know, anyway. Well, they haven't learned yet. They haven't obviously had the experience in life to be able to get to that next phase. So, you know, it's like, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, Hopefully. <laughs> That seems weird, man. Um, what's the most important thing your dad taught you? Um, I mean, the great thing, which really was great, that, that he was able to change like that. He was so, you know, stuck in his ways and all of that stuff. My mum changed a lot. Uh, she passed away when she was 72, so that was really young, mm. you know. But um, he... He was able to change, and he actually, I, I loved watching him go through that experience of morphing into this young man. You know, the older he got, the, the younger he got. I, I would, in, in a million years, wouldn't have imagined him for a second sitting in a. We were in East LA in this vegan Chinese place, and he's eating. <laughs> I, I remember that thinking, "Fuck, this is awesome!" You know, and he, he really. <laughs> He, he, he moved towards it and, and was was opening it up, and I, I just loved that. And I loved the fact that you're never too old to to have that experience. So that's what, what I got off of him was just brilliant. You know, I did. I tell you about the nudist thing. No, the nudist camp. Oh, this is fucking great. <laughs> so my dad, he, he goes, he's my mum, his his wife or his second wife or girlfriend. Um, and my auntie all died within three months of each other. Oh, and so God. he would constantly be, <sighs> my auntie Grace got Alzheimer's and she'd, she'd call my dad and he was like 75 at the time. And, and he, she'd go, Ken, bloody, someone stole the keys. The, the locks, can you change the locks? And he went around there and she just misplaced it. So he changed the locks. <laughs> and my mom, he would still make sure she was okay, go around. She's all right. They all die three months from e- for each other, and um, he's on his own, and and that's when he started to grow. And I, I'm not not being morbid or anything because he he was devastated, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But um, he, it became about him then, and I, I was taking note. And he said, he said, you know, I've never asked for anything. He said, but do you think you could get me a trailer, like a, a caravan? I said, yeah, okay. Well, well, well I'm, I want to go traveling. I said, but Dad, you're you're 75, and he goes, yeah. And I'm like. Great. Okay. So he started doing this. He, he in Brighton or, or what's, it, what's the name? It was Red. It's, it's near Brighton in England. And he's perfect. He's got his little TV, his radio's in there. He's reading the newspaper, drinking a cup of tea. And he's in this field. And that's kind of where he was staying. He just kind of hitched out there. It's December. So it's kind of cold, but he's just having a great time. There's a field over there. And there's all this party going on and just stuff. And these people come up and they go, um, we notice you're on your own, but you, you can come over here. We have a, a, a this whole community over there. If you want to come over. And he said, yeah, I'll come over. It's Christmas. And this is gone. And they said, but we're naturalists. And he thought, <laughs> I'm probably like my son, you know, he's vegetarian type. <laughs> so he goes over Excellent. there. Dad, it's a nudist colony. <laughs> but that, so he, he, he ends up moving his caravan into this fucking place and becomes it part of this community and they start traveling to spain and there's all these things and he's driving he's got his, his thing so the growth was absolutely unbelievable the fact that his truck driver is now traveling to spain with a nudist colony that is uh, really cool was was so brilliant yeah. he's trying all these different things in, in his life and it was amazing like i said he, he was just getting started when he died. And, and, and that's what I got off of my dad. The, the fact that he was so open and that, that again, you know, that any age you can, you can learn so much was, was, was amazing. That is really inspiring. That's cool. Yeah. Man. How about your mom? Most important thing she taught you. Yeah. I, and she, she was growing as well, but a, a different thing, you know, I, I, I got a house for her in, in a nicer part of London. Cause you know, where I grew up wasn't, 
wasn't great. Yeah. And um, it's great now. It's, you can't even afford to get anywhere near it. <laughs> That's it's the like, way. You know, like Brooklyn, you know, yeah. you go there now and it's like fucking gentrified to fuck, you know. So the same thing there, you know. Um, but she was going, she became a vegetarian. She, for the same reasons that, and not, not that I kind of forced her into it, but uh, yeah, you know, she traveled. She actually came, when we were recording slang albums, she came out to Spain with my auntie and they were like, this is great. Can we stay here? I'm like, yeah, this is great. So I had two spare rooms and they, they just blast. That was so really they, cool. again, opening up the older they got, which was super cool. It's funny because your, your auntie was f- like your dad's sister. And then her. Yes, so absolutely. my wife had the same thing where her parents split at a really young age, but she was close to her mom, of course. But then her her auntie on her dad's side, like, kind of helped raise her. So it was really, uh, that, yeah, right. yeah, it was, yeah, uh, weird, yeah. it was kind of weird, but I mean, it, it was great. I mean, it was very loving. They had, a, you know, it was, totally. uh, yeah. when it's all part of the same family and, and you look at it like that, because for me, you know, I, I didn't see a difference. Yeah. Mum's sister, dad's sister, whatever. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I'm here all the time. That's my auntie Grace. So it was easy, but I, from from her perspective, you know, I, I get it. But I think she was closer to Grace than she was to her own sisters. Yeah, which, so it was the same with with uh, well, Anne's mom. Yeah, crazy, great. Yeah. Though. yeah. Well, look, I think it's intent. You know, as long as you're you're feeling love, I mean, yeah. I think that's really all I care about as a kid. You know, it, it's it's yeah. who loves you and who you know makes you feel safe. I guess you know. Definitely. Uh, you have any non musical superpowers? You dude, you gotta have you got all that energy. You've got to have a superpower or two. I, from what I gather, you know, the, the inspiring people to get fit is, is kind of a, a cool thing to do because I, I hear that more than anything else. Like you know, just done two interviews this morning, and everyone always brings it up. They go, "Well, you know, just stay in shape." And have you got any tips or any recommendations? And yeah, I, I, I usually say, you know, I, say, I, I don't like the alternative. You know, it's like a. <laughs> And that's really the motivation. This, and like I said, it doesn't kill you. It's not like crazy amounts. I mean, I've done that. I've done like, you know, you know, working out three times a day, doing different things, doing weights in the morning, doing cardio, like kickboxing and stuff, and then do something later on. And it's great. You you feel awesome. But you don't have to do that all the time. It's, it's just a – it depends on what, what the goal is, really. And I think, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I like that that fact. That it, that it kind of inspires other people to do that. I've I've met people and they go, you know, I've been following what you do and I've lost a hundred pounds. Or you know, I've I've met lots of people that that's that pretty that. serious, man. Yeah, it really is. So I I, I don't take it lightly. I, I kind of um, you're in great, great shape. So I mean, it's oh thanks. You know, you, but you you know you work hard. It's not a surprise yeah. you're doing that much work. You, you look like yeah. that. You know, what yeah. is your routine now as far as like you, you're lifting and you're doing cardio every day? Yeah. At the moment, I, I just I had a week off from. The, we was building up to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and then I was like, "Fuck!" As soon as we got out there, I was I had a big bowl of French fries and, and oh, in the city, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. That that was cool. But I I think um you know we have a, a guy Eric the trainer. He comes mm. on tour with us, and it's amazing. He's got this whole different uh, technique, so you don't injure yourself, especially as you, you know anyone over fifty. It's easy to oh. to fuck something up, like you know, a, a overextend a joint or pull something. Rotator so, always. Yeah, yeah, limited range of motion. Like you're in, instead of like a, if you're doing like a, a shoulder press, you know, instead of going like that, you'd literally just go like that, and 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 the angle's different. So all these little things that that, that we do, he comes out on tour with us. Um, but me at the moment, I like, last couple of days, I've just been. Yeah, dumbbells. I, I vary up every day. Like I've done ch- not too heavy chest because that means you can't do it the next day. If you if you keep it kind of low and consistent, that that means you're not tearing shit up, and you can do that. But again, you know that's that's another way of of, of look, working as uh, as well as like doing really heavy, having a break, doing a, you know a, a, another body block. You know the chest one day, the back the next. Mm. But I, I I kind of kind of keep in in the Eric train of. of Thought where you where you kind of do a little bit of everything, we just don't overdo it. And then I'm doing cardio at the same time. I just started kicking again because I am um, last year I'd, I'd hurt my hip. I kicked something and it didn't move. It was like a, a, a solid thing. It was like fuck, that really hurt. And um, that's all healed up. That's all cool. And I'm, I'm back to kicking again. So 
That, and it's really funny. You do say that and you go, oh, perhaps it's because I'm old. It's not. It's because I fucking kicked something that didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, and it fucked my shit up. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I had te- physical therapy. I had massages and that. And it's all exactly like it was, it was before now. Everything's back to normal. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just do a bit of that. I kind of do abs every day and, and, then, and then the diet thing, you know, and I kind of, kind of reduce stuff the, the closer I get to a tour. How, how many uh, minutes of cardio are you doing a day? I, it depends. It, it's uh, like sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and, and on an empty stomach do like 25 minutes on a spin bike. Okay. That that would be cool if I'm doing that. But, yeah, no more than half an hour. Okay. But, really. but you, do you do it every day or five days a week? or how, do you do it? No, I, I do something every day. Oh, you sometimes, do? Uh, I mix it up. I do weights and cardio, so like an HIIT thing. You know, yeah, yeah circuit training and um that that's really good and 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 again change it some days it's just weights and then other days it'd just be i I usually do weights or or at least push-ups that's what i'm going to do today i'm going to do pull-ups push-ups kick the bag and 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 abs that's gonna you have a little gym in the house oh yeah yeah that's cool very cool man I, I, I even on tour you know and there's nothing around i'm jumping rope between two trucks (laughs) <laughs> to get workout in, but some, something, anything, you know. But that's why you look the way you do. So it's not like you know, people. Right. Um, it's for sure, people say, "Oh, you have good genetics." I know you're working your ass off. It. Yeah. I, not that you're old, but at 61, you got to be working your ass off to look yeah. like that, man. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not, yeah. No free lunch. Uh, hey, man. Two more questions. Uh, most difficult decision you've had to make, or most difficult thing you've had to do. going through actually my first divorce was kind of hard because you know you have kids involved so that was that was really tough and and it's you know rory's 29 now and and we're all all still seeing remnants of that so that's that's a tough one you know that that whole thing so you know uh, that's handled um is really important so yeah you know kids are all human beings are really delicate and fragile I think you just have to be mindful. Of that. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit, you know, Tyrannosaurus hide, and it's kind of, you know, tough skin and all that stuff. And but that's that. Sometimes that doesn't work with other people, so you yeah. have to be mindful of everything else. So you don't kind yeah. of get that message until you get older, though, right? right. <laughs> that's true. It's like, oh shit! Yeah, yeah but it's done. yeah. yeah. In- it's true, man. I, Good I, to get the message. Though. Great, it's great getting a memo at, at any at any time. Yeah, better late than never. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think unless you were raised that way, right, right. But if you right. weren't, you don't get that memo. Right. And some people never get it. You know, I got. Yeah. Got it. it sounds like you got it, but I got it later as well. You know, it's like, oh, I, you yeah. Know, you can't. You got to relax. You know, you got to. And the last question, and I can't thank you enough for. All your time, man. I really, oh, enjoy, I really enjoyed great. chatting with you, man. Biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of that's been deliberate, and how much is a part of aging? I think it's a down to experience, and I think it's constant. I, I think, um, and the reason it seems to speed up is because you get more experienced. It's like when you're younger, it's a, it's less less of an experience, and and you're less experienced, so. As you get older, if you're still um, open, you're still a conductor, and you're you're bringing it all in and letting it all out, it speeds up because you you. It's like years. They go. Well, it seems the years are speeding up. Yeah, because incrementally, you know, ten years is is a, a lot more. It, it little increment it speeds up because it's ten years is is one and one year is one year of your life when you're one. So yeah, it, it, it's the same thing with experience. I think it um it constantly keeps moving and, and growing i think it's uh that's why it appears that way but i don't think that's the case i think you just become more experienced and like i said you know you apply i know, I know that's exactly what i do I, I apply these new experiences and they it, you you get a, a better reading because you're you're more qualified to, to deal with it at, at that stage um thank you man let me just tell people oh, what all this stuff honestly man i really really enjoy this uh well, let me t- tell people what you got going on um so phil has a new demarzio pickup coming up it's called the sugar sahara 
Sugar chakra. Sugar chakra. Sorry about that. When yeah. talk about that. Yeah, um, that's really cool. It's um, a single. I'll show you. Actually, I've got I've got one on on this strap. Hang on a second. Awesome. I'll just show you. So it's a. Uh, okay. It's the black. It's yeah. The black one. It's got okay. Browser, but it, um, it we start with a super distortion, and I was I was trying them out on on the G three tour. You know, we were having. That's a beautiful um, neck, man. Is that yeah, think, Rosewood or Ebony? Is this nice? Yeah, and- Rosewood. This this one. Um, it's really Alex dark. Alex Perez at, at Fender, because Fender and, and Jackson are in the same building. Mm. Yeah, I went in there once, and he said, "Oh, I've got a present for you." And he got the specs off of my PC one and made a Strat neck. So it, this is just fucking awesome. What a, God, you really like big necks? I could see how thick that yeah. is. Holy yeah. crap! It's pretty chunky. It's, it's yeah. Great. This one feels really good. So we, but with the the pickup, we kept, you know, adjusting things. It's really high powered. It's like more powered than a super distortion. But um, it also is clean. I, I, again, if you get a chance to see the, uh, uh, we we done hysteria and and sugar on um, Good, Morning Good Morning America. On one of those songs, I used, I think I used it on Sugar actually. Um, I, I used this the strap with the. The, the prototype the proper one and it just sounds clear it's just like just got this clarity to it but it's got all this firepower it's crazy so that's something i really wanted you know is to be able to everything you ever wanted you know it's that that kind of hybrid all, all at the same time very cool man and so it's the sugar chakra and any idea when it's coming out uh soon i, soon. I don't know because i yeah i just done a thing i actually got a talk to larry but I, i've just done a thing so he's gonna be getting that on the go probably in the next couple of weeks that's awesome fantastic yeah. congratulations on that man thank you and then uh solo album yeah um i've been working on the on the the delta deep stuff and and other things as well like instrumentals that i've, that I've just had laying around and and songs uh me and my friend cj vanston who's just a, an amazing songwriter and producer. And he used to be like this top session player in, in uh, Chicago, you know, everyone fucking Tony Bennett, Barbara Streisand, Tina. T- I mean, you name it, you know, it's like, you know, everyone. So, um, and he just produced the last Toto album as well. So we're the same age and we've written so many songs together. And uh, so I, I think some of these, deserve to be on this album as well because they were just sitting there and they're just awesome so yes yeah, so it's, it's like a, a a really kind of um diff, quite diverse but you can you know you can tell it's me i'm here so, so it should be fun and when is, will that be out this year no no probably next year and probably the def leopard album uh will be next year we, we've just started on that we got stuff floating around but it's uh you haven't finished anything yet that's great man i look forward to both of that very cool um Thanks. dude thank you for i think you should have a uh like a you know uh phil collin fire walking like tony robbins I, I see that as a that's a plan that's in b c or d plan for you man i think you're okay uh, that's I, th- good. I think wow. you're there uh thank you for everything man i, I really appreciate Absolutely. it it's been a, a joy Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thank you very much to Phil Collin for spending time with us. Uh, Please check out all the guitarists out there, the Sugar Chakra. Um, I'm having a brain fart here. Pickup (laughs) from Demarzio that's coming out. And uh, look for more music from Phil and potentially from Delta Deep next year. Uh, Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. (laughs) 